This is John Hernandez here with a true icon in music today. He's a former member of Megadeth, done some amazing solo work along with bands like Damn the Machine and now with Ohm. He has guest appeared on some of the most amazing albums of our generation, the one and only Chris Poland. Chris, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Hey, thanks for having me, John. First off, the main project you're working on now, Ohm, I would love to just get a bit of background on it for them that might have not heard of it, uh, the band members when the band formed. Yeah, um, Robbie Pagliari is our bass player. I've known him since I first moved to California in the late 70s, and we formed a kind of rock jazz fusion band called the New Yorkers, and we did that for years and then um, kind of parted ways for a while. Of course, I joined Megadeth, and he um, played in a number of other bands. Then we got together again uh, in the in the mid-90s and just said, let's just, you know, do what we love to do, and so that's what we've been doing ever since. And then David Eagle, our drummer, he was our drummer on our first record, and then um, he left the band uh, to do other stuff for a while, and then he came back a couple years ago, which was great because he's a he's really a, a perfect drummer for Ohm. He was the original drummer in Oingo Boingo. He's played with, um, I believe, Alfonso Johnson from Weather Report, Tina Turner, Willie Bobo. He played with him for years. He's just a great drummer. Does a lot of Afro-Cuban stuff, but can also do uh, like Middle Eastern uh, Persian style beats, which is pretty cool. What is Ohm up to right now? Is there any new material, any shows coming up you guys are working on? Yeah, we have. We just played last week at the Big Potato, but um, we always write new material, so there's always something new on the horizon for the band. We've recorded the record live in the studio once, then we started to track it again, and just things just didn't feel right, so we kind of put it on hold. I think that's going to change uh, probably in the next like six months. We'll probably have, a, have the record done. You said you're always writing new material. Uh, does the band or you guys, do you have a certain writing process or is it riff driven? No, usually I'll come in with, you know, like a core idea, you know, a uh, verse bridge chorus idea. And then I'll start playing it and then Pag will have a, you know, suggestion and David will have suggestions. And then, you know, we just suss it out until we go there. That's it. You know, somebody will start playing something like uh, there's a song called um, Amino Acid Flashback. That was a that came out of a jam. That was Pag's kind of idea of um, while we were jamming. And then we took it and made it into that song. So, you know, once in a while that happens, too. We make sure when we come into the studio, the first thing we do is to warm up is to jam. And I always record everything. So. I know you've done a slew of guest appearances on just about every style and genre out there. Do you have any recent guest appearances you've been working on? I did um, some solos for um, Gar Samuelson's old band. His uh, original singer sent me um, some stuff to solo over. I feel terrible because I can't remember his name right now. I'll do, um, if I like the music, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, you know. And I do a lot of them, and I usually go over to my friend Randy Pebblers. It's uh, Ram Song Studios, and, and I love working with him because I, you know, bounce ideas off him, and he always lets me know if, um, you know, he gives me his two cents, and I kind of appreciate it. Well, I know you was at NAMM this year. Any really cool stories or, or things you were working on over there? I talked with uh, Palmer from Germany, the uh, Tar uh, Direct Box Company. I met with Robin, and I told him, you know, I'm really interested in your products. And then, um, lo and behold, now I'm endorsed by them. I, I think what it was was I, I, I'm not sure he knew um, who I was or, you know, what what it mattered, you know. And and when I went to their booth, so then when I went to play the Eminence booth, I wanted to use a Palmer amp because there's usually one there every year, and there wasn't one. So they ran over to the Palmer booth to grab an amp, and Robin came back with the amp, and then he went, hey, you were just at my booth. You know, he thought, well, you know what? You know, I think I can give Chris an endorsement. So. <laughs> right on, right on. I've been reading a lot about uh, your signature guitar with Schechter. How did that come about? You know, here at the studios, and um, a guy came in my office and handed me uh, a bunch of uh, pamphlets and stuff from, from Schechter and said, hey, they want to talk to you about possibly coming on the roster. And at the time, Yamaha was kind of just falling apart, and John Gadesi was leaving. 
and I'd been working with John for over 10 years. He did all my guitar work for years and years and pickups and everything. And so I kind of thought, well, John's leaving. You know, I might as well split. So then um, when I went to the meeting, you know, they kind of sat me down and talked to me, told me, you know, what's what. And I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. And they said, okay, great. Now we're going to tell you, you know, we're going to give you the big surprise is John Gadefsky starts work today here. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah. I was astounded that, you know, he was going to be working at Schechter the day I started or being endorsed. So it was a win-win situation, plus the guitar is amazing. When they first, I had a, an SLS Solo 6, I had them put a Floyd on it. So it was kind of like a modified stock guitar. But when they made the Poltergeist, they sat down and, and you know, we sat down, me and Mike, and um, and kind of talked about how to do it and what we what I wanted. And, and there's something about when they build a guitar, you know, and make it a production guitar, something, all the things seem to come together, and it's really a great guitar, man. Even if it wasn't my guitar, I would play this guitar. So you were directly involved then from the beginning with that particular model? Yeah, and I, I didn't want to change a lot. Of, you know, like I didn't want to go in there and like invent some new body style because I don't want to, I know that's not, it's not cool to go in and have them have to machine up to make a guitar. So I, I took the guitar that I liked and I changed the headstock and I changed the scale length and I made it play the way I wanted it to play but still kept all their, you know, like their headstock is their stock headstock, but we reversed the headstock so it looks a little bit different. And, you know, I just made it so out of all their guitars, you know, this one is a little bit different, and it's it's got everything I like on it. It's got a great Floyd Bridge on it. It's got John Gadesi's hand wand pickups on it. Basically, you're getting what I would have, even if I wasn't endorsed by Schechter, if I brought a Les Paul-style guitar in there, that's probably what it would sound like because John would be doing all the electrical work on it, all the pickups and, and wiring and stuff. So, I've been working with Rob over at Stone Tone. I did a write-up on my blog for his rock blocks. Um, I know you're working with Rob also. I would love to hear how you guys met, your use of the products of band, what they've done to affect your tone, the whole nine yards. Yeah, we were over by the Floyd booth, and Rob was standing there, and, and somehow we started talking. I had tried everything. I tried the original block that comes on a Floyd. I tried the big brass blocks, the little brass blocks. I mean, everything you could do, right? I didn't try titanium because it's too expensive, and I've been told that by everybody that um, it's too bright. So anyway, he had a block in his hand, and he, goes, he just gave it to me. He goes, here, put this on your guitar and tell me what you think. And I didn't think much of it. You know, I was like, you never know. It could be great. It could not be great, but I wasn't going to get all excited about it because I don't do that anymore. I just try and whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And when I put it on, I was really surprised. I was like, there was just something was happening. It's almost like, you know, I put a brand new set of strings on it. I got the thing all intonated. And when I when I started playing it, it just felt like the notes were popping right off the neck. Like it, it just, like I do a lot of legato and um, it, leaned, it lent a lot of help to the legato because there's a lot of sustain happening. And at the time, I was tuned down a half step, so, you know, I wasn't getting the full impact of having the strings at A440. And just recently, we tuned up. When you're tuned to A440 with a don't tone, you know, block on your bridge, you'll notice the difference, man. It's like, it's like twice as much sustain as it was tuned down a half step. Yeah, I can't say enough about that. And, you know, every tone is subjective. A lot of people, they don't even want a Floyd bridge, whatever. If you use a Floyd bridge, maybe you like the original block. That's your business. For me, man, that block, it's just got so much tone to it. I can't say enough about it. And I know it's expensive and it's a hassle. Take it all apart, put it back together, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's just worth it for me. And if, if anybody out there is thinking about doing it, maybe you should go find a guitar that has one on it and then A-B it with a guitar that doesn't, and then you'll know because, the you know, the proof's kind of in the pudding there. So. Well, and it also comes down to what are you willing to pay to get your sound and the time and the effort to put into it? No, I totally agree with you 100%. Well, I mean, you can pay 60 bucks for a brass block, or you can pay 120 bucks for a granite block. But in the end, you know, if it works for you, it, it's kind of worth it. I mean, it's you're paying the same price you would for an MXR pedal. Believe me, it does a lot more than an MXR pedal. So I don't want to do a hard sell on, on anybody with this tone, stone tone block. I love it. And like I said, tone is subjective. Other people m might not like it. I won't play a guitar without one on it, and that's all I can say. So well, while we're on the subject of kind of gear, we talked about the guitar, the block. What's some other gear that you, that Chris Poland cannot live without? I'm really a fan of uh, Bruce 
Agnator's um, work at NAMM, I actually got to sit down and play his Rebel 20. But ever since then, I can't get that amp out of my head. I'm going to find a way where I can juice extract it and get it in my system, in my rack system somehow. Because that little amp, that's the best sounding uh, distorted lead tone I've heard in a long, long time. It has the 6V6 EL84 kind of knob where you can turn it back and forth and in between. But there's something about Bruce's uh, gain, the way he goes about getting gain on solo and crunch channels and stuff. I just love his work. So I have a, an old Red Face IE4 four-channel preamp that he made a long, long time ago in the early 90s. I love it. I've had um, I've had three of them, and all three were good, but I, I kept the best one of the three. I had to sell the other ones to buy some recording equipment for the studio. I kind of regret it because I'll probably never see another one, but that's what I'm using now. That's kind of like something i got to have. Really, the most important thing is... is um, it's kind of the basics, man. It's like your strings are important, and so are your speakers. You know, there's there's strings, speakers, guitar, and amp. You know, everything else in between, you know, can kind of come and go. But I um, I was at a friend's house years ago, and um, I picked up all his guitars, and they all just played great. And I said, I said, what's the deal? What kind of strings do you use? And he said, I use Ernie Ball pens, and that was it. As soon as I put them on my guitar, I was like, that's that's the sound. You know, and everybody says, oh, that's baloney, man. All strings are made by the same company. And, I, you know, that might be true, but there's something about any ball strings that, that those strings I can't play guitar without one, you know, without a set on them. And then uh, my speakers are eminent, and I used Celestium for years and always struggled with, the, with the, the really screechy top end, no matter what I did. You know, most Celestium speakers, they won't sound good unless you take a 100-watt head and, and dime it and then you kind of are crushing that, the, the speaker enough to get it to warm up. I don't really play like that, so when I tried eminent speakers, I was blown away, and then luckily they gave me an endorsement, so I filled all my cabinets with uh, Tonkers, and I really like the Tonker speaker. The Man of War is a great speaker, and so are, uh, oh, God, what's that other speaker? It's the blue one. I can't remember the name because I'm, I'm not using those live anymore, but you really can't go wrong with eminent speakers and that. You know, I think people are like, well, yeah, they're so inexpensive compared to Celestians. And then, well, the reason that is is because they're made in in America. They don't have to ship them anywhere, so you're basically getting a great speaker at a great price. And then, as far as amps go, I have a lot of different power amps. I have a uh, I have Mesa power amps. I have old PD Classic power amps, and I have a really old Angle power amp that before they got really big that I really love. But my main power amp right now is a modified uh, PV Classic 120 120. And I had a uh, stretch over at um, Valley Sound, do a mod on it, and um, I really love it, man. Uh, my friend over at Ear Candy Cabs, he got me playing eminent speakers, and I, I got to agree. Well, in Ernie Ball 10s, that's what I used to, so it's really awesome to hear somebody of your caliber talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's just something about them, man. You know, but I was thinking about it on the way to the studio today, but if you think about it, there's so many options. You could go buy four Greenback Celestians, and everybody says they're the best, you know. And then what if you don't like them? You just spent, you know, five, over $500 on four speakers. Now what? It's a, it's a real struggle in guitar because there's so much to try. And, you know, the money thing is, is crazy. It's, you know, we're all musicians, man. You can't have, you know, you can't go out and buy everything and try it. I'm just lucky that somehow I always fall into, I find something that works for me, and it's usually by accident. One question that I got asked by a ton of different people is what music does Chris Pullen like and what music really inspires you to play? I like a lot of different music. Like there's certain Doyle Bramhall songs and, and I really can't remember the names of them because my manager will send me like a compilation disc and I'll put it in and there'll be a couple Doyle Bramhall songs that just kill me, you know, and I got to listen to them every day for a week. You know, back in the day I was into before Megadeth, before all this, um, I was really into jazz and fusion and stuff. And I, not to say that I can sit down and go play Giant Steps with a, with a, you know, a hardcore jazz band. I can't. But that's the kind of music I love to listen to. So I'm a big Wayne Shorter fan from Weather Report. I'm a big Joe Zalanu fan from Weather Report. I love Jan Hammer. I love Jeff Beck uh, and John McLaughlin. But I also love Robin Trower and Hendrix and Clapton and Page and Beck and... You know, Leslie West, the Allman Brothers, you know, I mean, I could just go on and on and on, you know. It's, I, I just like all music, you know. It's, it's like there's, if, if I'm drawn to it, I, I'll usually buy it and listen to it until 
you know, I have to stop and listen to something else. But I'm very um, kind of like addicted like that. If I like something, I have to listen to it until it just, you know, it's embedded in my brain. Um, another question that come up was, do you have any hobbies um, away from music and being in studios and recording and touring that you like to do to unwind from the music world? Yeah, I'm a big movie fan. No, I really don't have a lot of time, man. But I have, um, I have the band thing and, and, and the music thing. But I also have a family. I have a daughter, Kaylee, who's six going on seven. My wife, Allison, and um, really important to me that I kind of don't make music, you know, just kind of overwhelm everything. So it's a, it's a learning thing for me. I have to, like, really, you know, discipline myself to not sit at the studio for 10 hours and then come home and go, oh, yeah, I missed dinner, you know. I guess my hobby would be my, my we, we bought a house in Burbank. We got lucky. I can't tell you the whole story, but there was no way we could afford it. But somehow certain things happened and we got it, you know, so... I guess my hobby is getting my lawn together. What would you say to a band out there that's trying to get their name out there? They're out there, they're trying to record, they're playing the clubs, they're trying to go um, to kind of help give them a boost. Well, I say go for it, you know, but the one thing that I tell anybody, you know, if you're going to play music and, and, you know, if you're playing it because you want to be rich and famous, that's going to be really hard because it might not work out. But if you play music, guitar, bass, drums, keyboards, whatever it is you do, whether it's, you know, whether you're a painter, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you love to do, if you love to do it and you do it for free, then you're going to be fine, you know, because making money in music is, is not what it used to be. And I just, I can't help myself. This is what I, I've done my whole life. I love guitar. I love to, there's something about it. It's very, um like healing to me in a way i don't know how to describe it it's just good for my soul and it's something i love to do and i'll do it until i'm dead you know but as far as the struggle of trying to get out there and get a name for yourself yeah it's a struggle you're going to hold your head in your hands and wonder why you know i mean sometimes i i say to myself you know why didn't i follow a different path you know you know because now i have a daughter and a family and money is tight and you know, sometimes I say, you know, like maybe I should have done this, gone to college, whatever, you know. Everybody has those thoughts. I don't second guess that I love playing guitar. I just, I wish, you know, I could be like those bands, get out there and, you know, I'm trying to hustle money playing guitar. I do do that, you know, but don't put all your eggs in one basket, man, because it's cruel. The music business is cruel. If you're not attached to it in a monetary way and you just love music, then it's not cruel because they can't touch you. I love how you worded all of that. I don't want to keep you for too long. I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I appreciate this more than you'll ever know. I've been a, a massive fan for as long as I can remember. Down the road, I would be more than honored to sit and talk with you more. Oh, absolutely, man.